Hello everybody and welcome to an audio based version of the Right to Dishonourable. My name, this voice you're hearing now is Jazza. Hello. Um, and then Jimmy is also here. Hello Jimmy. Hello. That, so when you hear a voice that isn't this voice, it will be him. So that's how you differentiate when there isn't a visual medium helping you out. Um, we, on in traditional Right to Dishonourable shenanigans, we are terrible at technology. And so we decided to downgrade the amount of technology we needed to do in order to put out this podcast. Um, but that is neither here nor there. Hopefully you can stick this video on in the background and listen to our wonderful voices talk about the... What are we going to talk about, Jimmy? Uh, the European elections. Oh I my think. god, how excited are you to talk about this? Uh, somewhat, I'd say. Sort of yeah. Six, six out of ten, maybe. Six maybe a five. Six out of ten. Um, uh, yeah, so the uh, we are recording this on Monday the 26th of May. So um, today is when the final British um, uh, election results came out. Um, and for anybody who is vaguely right of gay people make floods happen, um, it wasn't a great <laughs> day, really, was it? Is that a category now? The That's right, a category right, now. The right of people make gay floods happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's Hitler, gay people make floods happen, um, women shouldn't be allowed burkas, and then all the way through to I want to be a tree. I, Those, I want that's to know the how, how I'd now. spot a gay flood. Like, how, <laughs> how do I tell the difference between that and a straight one? I'm sure that there will be a classification uh, scale coming out when uh, UKIP actually have a manifesto. So talking, we should probably uh, talk about the fact that UKIP are the first uh, non-Labour Conservative uh, what call it, political party um, uh, to win a national election in 100 years. Yeah, it does sound impressive, doesn't it? Um, but it is, <laughs> it, it's a European election, so you don't want to get too far ahead of yourselves, I think. But um, yeah, you it is. You sounded pretty chillaxed about this. I am, because I, I sort of buy the idea that they're not going to do all that well in the long term. Um, there's been a bunch of uh, magazines that have come out saying this is probably the peak of UKIP success. You could say that they're being a bit complacent, but I find it quite plausible. I don't think they'll do that well at the general election. They might get a seat or two, but when it comes to Westminster... They're politics, aiming for 20 seats, apparently. That is horrendously ambitious. It is um, horrendous, but then we were saying the same thing a couple of months ago when they said that they wanted to win the Euros. I suppose you could look at it that way, but I don't know. I The thing is... Because it's a proportional representation system, it's a lot friendlier to mm -hmm. fringe parties. That's the European elections I'm talking about. But when it comes down to first past the post, people... This is a, a general thing in, in most Western democracies, that people tend to dislike politicians, but be quite keen on their own candidates. So, I mean, this is true of me as well. I didn't jettison the Liberal Democrats at the local elections because I consider they're doing quite a good job mm -hmm. at local level, whatever my misgivings about. But the thing so. is, nobody is, I don't, well, the vast majority of people, I don't think, do vote in the Europeans or the local elections thinking about European or local issues. They just use it as a way of sticking two fingers up at whoever's in power or the, the major parties that maybe they would traditionally vote for, no? That's true, but that doesn't necessarily apply to general elections. No, true. So what does this mean then? So we as the electorate have stuck two fingers up at uh, Condem um, uh, <laughs> and uh, David Willyband. See, I feel, I feel even more ostracised than I usually do because I, I voted for Conservatives and Lib Dems. So I, I really backed the uh, incumbent government in this election, if you're looking at it in those terms. You really did. Um, I ended up uh, taking about seven of those surveys that told you how you can, like, who you should vote for. Um, <laughs> and I basically should have voted for this government. <laughs> Right, so you're being, you're actually being quite well represented then. You really should be fighting True, for the status quo. True, but I actually disagree with quite a lot of what's happening. But anyway. Did you find when you took seven of them that each one gave you a different result? Or was it all fairly consistent? Um, There was one that was going around my Facebook group, um, my Facebook uh, like feed, that 
seem to be very green-leaning, funnily enough. Um, uh, and I took it, and I apparently should be voting green. And I don't want to vote for the greens because they seem incompetent. <laughs> incompetent and nuts, to be mm. fair. Um, um, lovely and a ve- and good for them. They beat the Lib Dems. They came fourth. Shall we talk about how the Greens came fourth? How insane is that? Like they're a legitimate local and European political force in the UK now. I don't know. I mean, the only people I spoke to who actually voted for the Greens basically did it as a protest vote. Yeah, uh, I think they're traditional Lib Dem voters who feel a little bit pissed off that the Lib Dems are having to compromise on their values. Yeah, that did seem to be the case. And it seemed to be people who were still disillusioned with Labour because, at least as far as policies go, it seems to me the Greens are fairly close to the left of Labour. That, mm-hmm. um, that seems to be roughly their platform. Um, it seemed to be people who couldn't stomach Labour, didn't want to vote for the Lib Dems either. So the only left-wing party they're kind of left with is the Greens. But Do you think that we are going to see a shift here at all in the run-up to next year's general election? Do you think that the UKIP are going to be able to get any seats at all? Because some I people are that... saying that there's the possibility of that get them getting a couple, and some people are just like, bugger them, it's never going to work. I don't know, because there's a, there's a big drive towards, it. this is in UK politics at least, mm-hmm. to having professional election managers, whereas it used to be delegated to... Um, you know, a an old member of the party or someone with a lot of experience, but now they're bringing in people whose entire job is dedicated towards winning elections. People mm-hmm. like, is it David Axelrod? Um, Axelrod, can... who used to run the Obama campaign. Exactly. and Is now working for Ed Miliband. The, these, these sort of things cost a ton of money, but they do tend to be pretty effective. And this is the sort of thing that UKIP and the Greens are not going to be able to buy into. And there's going that I I still think that if you throw a ton of money at something, you tend to get the result. Um, but Labour haven't gotten the result. Labour have actually underperformed. They've come second, but they've scraped into second place. And the Conservatives have actually ended up with the same number of MEPs as them. Surely this is a failure for the Labour Party. No, I think that's true, but I don't think it will pan out that way at the general election. And I think what I'm, what I more meant to say is that I don't think UKIP have the tools to target particular seats. I think they just don't have the infrastructure in place. They don't have the experience. I don't. I don't see that the general election would go particularly well for them. Um, I think you're underestimating them. I think the more that I learn about the way that the party is put together, um, and the more sane people who are going over to UKIP, it, I think that they are going to be a scary force in 2015. And oh, granted, they're not going to get 20 seats, but I think that they might break into one, two, or three um, uh, parliamentary representatives. Well, say they get two or three seats, so what? Like, yeah. It's a, it's a parliament of 650 people. But everybody has three... to start somewhere. They do, and I, I get. I think if you're looking at the very long game, there's a possibility they might do well, but if they don't do well in the short term, um, a lot of their strategy seems to be built up around whether or not we have a referendum within the next course of the parliament. And if we do have a referendum, and whichever way that goes, if, if we end up voting to leave the EU that would seem to, you know, the party would no longer have a reason to exist. If yeah, choose that to stay would be awkward because then they'd actually have to come up with some policies. Well, I don't see that they're going to survive beyond the, beyond the EU referendum. I mean, the best thing for them in terms of their longevity as a party would be for the referendum not to take place as far as I can see. But I don't know how but you feel But then you, you'd assume, well, we're hoping that they will actually have a manifesto released before next year's election that will be novel because they went into this election without a manifesto um uh, and so essentially people voted for them without actually knowing what their policies were well they only have they only have two policies basically they want to leave the eu and they want to cut down immigration which you could even argue is one policy they also want a flat rate of tax right is is that a thing yeah that's a thing um although it seems like ukip representatives don't really understand their own policy line. And so you get a lot of... So, obviously, the one issue that they keep on banging about, on about is we need to eat, leave the EU. 
But then whenever there is any kind of uh, diversity in term that whenever the journalist or the interviewer asks about any different questioning um, in terms of UK policy, there is confusion and fear in their eyes because they don't know. Because they don't, and that's one of the problems with UKIP, they don't have party whips and they don't have a uh, somebody making them toe the line and knowing actually what they are representing and what they are standing for. They say that, oh, we stand for local people. No, you bloody don't. You stand for yourself, you silly old kip. <laughs> I suppose it depends which local people you're talking about. Um, but this, this seems to be the contradiction within UKIP, is that their entire shtick is, we're anti-establishment, but... Them They're being... run by a bloody stockbroker who used to they be are... in the Conservative Party. That that is an irony. But what I was more talking about was oh, sorry, go, go, go on. I'm just bitter. Was the kind of lack of professionalism within the party and the lack of uniformity? Seems but people to be... love that. That's the thing. It's like a fucking X Factor audition. Does that sort of logic apply to the general election as it applies to you know the local elections and the European ones? George Galloway has a seat in Parliament. Yeah, I suppose, but um... but then his success couldn't like his success is because of local efforts in his party and a strong basis in the Muslim network in the UK. Um, that's the reason that he does well and that he is now a representative in Parliament. Caroline Lucas, as well, the only Green um, member of Parliament in Westminster. Um, uh, I think hers is also based on very solid campaigning and the appearance of the Greens knowing what they're doing. But I think UKIP, they're chaotic, but people, so far, people have warmed to that and people have liked it, and that scares me. It's it's that idea that they are being given the amount of power that they are being given on the basis of very little legitimacy. So, so say that they get 20 seats in the next parliament, which won't happen. But I leave it. the country and I'm going to become <laughs> Spanish. That's what happens. <laughs> I'm not even joking. <laughs> but so, say that did happen. How do you think that would affect um, UK parliamentary politics then? Well, it would mean that votes were being taken away from both of the main parties. It would probably put uh, another coalition... Um, uh, on the cards, um, I think it w- if UKIP were to gain that many seats, it would be very difficult for them to, uh, for any party to have a majority. It would be very weird if they did have a majority, and then there would probably be a coalition. No, Twenty seats is not all that much. It de- it sort of depends. It how isn't, the rest of the voting but it went. can swing. It definitely a majority. could. Um, but in terms of the general policy of the UK Parliament, do you think that would? actually prompt a, a move to the right in terms of immigration policy and we've already stuff. seen a move to the right in terms of immigration policy because of the noise that UKIP are making certainly in terms of rhetoric but i don't necessarily think in terms of policy because there's a limited amount of you know they keep on they're, they're bringing in a cap on immigration yeah but it's not enforceable within the eu so no but a cap on immigration of people outside of the eu yes the the Immigration question is very much based around European Union immigration. But I think what people do get freaked out about more is the fact that there are people who are low skilled and coming from Indonesia and India and Pakistan. I think those are still contentious uh, immigrants that also that still cause a, a problem among the UKIP affiliated electorate. Yeah, you're probably right. Um... Mm. We're not going to use the R word. <laughs> uh, what hour would that be, Jazz? <laughs> um, it rhymes with lacist. So, um, uh, we've talked about the UK, but obviously the European parliamentary elections are Europe-wide, and it would be very silly and British of us to focus solely on the UK. Um, uh, and the right has, and the Eurosceptics have done particularly well um, uh, in these elections, um, namely the big one um, uh, that everybody is talking about is the fact that the Front National, the National Front um, uh, from France, has become the largest parliament. The largest, um, uh, not the largest parliament. The largest party in There European, you go, it French also European began politics. with P, that's why I got confused. Hey, what do you make of uh, this then, Jazza? So I used to watch um, uh, political broadcasts in French, when I learnt French, 
because I'm me and I <laughs> desperately lead a life. Um, uh, and I find Marine Le Pen fascinating. She is incredibly articulate. I can completely understand why people have a an affinity with her and why they like her. And I think her modernization of the Front National is work. It's clearly working. Um, although French people probably say the same thing about um, uh, about Farage. So you wouldn't you wouldn't compare Farage to Marine Le Pen then? Um, uh, I think no, uh, because the thing is, the National Front is racist. UKIP is just <laughs> anti-immigration. I think that there is a, is a distinct difference between the two uh, parties. Yes, there are a load of nutters and loonies who represent UKIP, and some people with unsavoury ways of putting across their point. But I think UKIP remains a immigration sceptic and an EU sceptic party, whereas the Front National is very much anti, uh, specifically Muslims. Um, uh, and they they won a load of um, uh, local elections recently in France. Um, uh, and there's talk of them uh, banning halal food being served in schools in those local districts. I mean, is it a similar situation where they're, they're well represented at local level? I, th- I mean, I imagine in France, local level politics is more important than it is in Britain, but that they're well, re- well represented at local level, but not so much in the national parliament. I believe... They, oh God, I read an article about this and I think they either have no representation in the parliament or they only have like two or three. Like they have very few seats. Um, But they too have come through with, I think it was over 30% of the vote in France. Mm. Like scarily large. I think it was 35% of the vote. But in, so, so in France and Britain, the Eurosceptic movements did quite well, but... From what I heard, Italy and Germany, that was not really the case so much. No, the Euro- there is the um, uh, uh, movement, f- the uh, German alternative or yes. something like that. I can't remember. Alternative for Deutschland, right? Yes. Oh, look at you being all German. <laughs> um, uh, so they got a couple of seats, but that's like us saying that if we were to draw anything from that, that would like be us saying that the UK is now going to be greenwashed because they've made some progress mm. um uh, the, oh, uh, the there were the in the danish part um uh, part of the elections they had a huge win for the eurosceptic party um the danish people's party the dpp they also won the election largest majority largest um amount of the vote um and obviously there's the greeks as well who now have lots of people who are fascist who represent them Yay! <laughs> so I mean, do, I'm guessing you don't buy the whole, or maybe you do. The idea that um, Britain, is, like sorry, not Britain, Europe is now sleepwalking back into fascism. That's been a very popular thread among commentators, particularly on the left. What do have you make they of that? really? I don't. I don't think they are. I think that people just really hate politicians, hmm. and I think it's that gap between the electorate and the elected that is the main issue here. Um, I think that a lot of people piggyback on the back of that sentiment and a lot of those people are unsavory and they are the people like the Godfrey Blooms um, who believe people should go back to Bongo Bongo land um, uh, and people like the National Front and genuine racists. Um, so if you had to adv- like give some advice to the, the main free parties in Britain, say, about what they should do given what's happened in this election. I mean, there's been there's suggestions going around um, now that Nick Clegg might have to stand down. Um, I really hope he doesn't, because I think that he's the only person who's come out of this, who went into this um, uh, European election and came out of it with a little bit of integrity, because he was genuinely trying to sell Europe. It's interesting. Well, like t- Tim Farron was um, on... BBC's coverage of the vote last night and he he was saying I'm really pleased that we came out and said what we believed in but obviously I I think that's admirable but they were destroyed in the vote Um, and maybe they were destroyed partly because of what they've been doing in the government rather than necessarily the pro-European platform they've been standing on uh, because Labour didn't do too badly and from what I can tell 
their European attitudes are relatively similar to Lib Dems. Um, but I don't know there's too much of a of a future, at least in the short term, for people who want to people in politics who want to promote the idea of the European quasi federation or whatever it is you think the Europeans gonna turn up as in the future. But the thing is that although we've seen a rise of Eurosceptics throughout Europe, they are still the the by a long way the minority in the European Parliament. Um and the European People's Party and the Socialists, who are the big two the centre left and the centre right blocks. So when for every anybody who doesn't know, when um uh, an MEP gets elected to the European Parliament, they then uh, join a grouping of other similarly aligned international parties from other countries. And the and as always, the, the two biggest groupings of this are the centre-left and the centre-right. And they are still, by policy, pro-European. And those, are, those two um, sections are also the largest in they make up the majority and so there's been talk of a grand coalition um to try and just kind of like shout out the eurosceptics which include the national front ukip the dpp um uh, and the winners in greece uh frankly the eurosceptics may have won in a lot of countries but they aren't going to be able to do anything because there's too many politicians who have been elected who have a vested interest in keeping Europe going. That's the issue that we have. And they will either ignore this wave of Euroscepticism or they, what they should do is try and change Europe and make sure that people are aware of what Europe is doing. So stuff like the, the trade agreement between the US and the EU, um, the TTIP, um, the European Army, and all of the other things that I mentioned in my European video the other week. Like, they need to, they need to fight for Europe on European issues, rather than, we're not in Parliament, in your home country, and we think the people who are in Parliament are shit. So vote for us in the EU, yay! <laughs> I mean... What do you think is the future for the EU then in terms of, do you think it will move towards a more federalised kind of state, a more centralised, well, that's almost the opposite, but do you think it will become more of an important political force then? If it tries to become a more federal state at the moment with the sentiment that is in the populace of the EU, um, then they are going to have a lot of very pissed off people on their hands. And that's only going to see a continuation of the rise of Eurosceptics and far-right parties. And I don't think anybody wants that because that's the whole point. That that was what the EU was made to stop. That was me like the EU was meant to stop there to be the chance of fascists running countries in Europe. There um, doesn't seem to be a very high chance of fascists running any countries in Europe right now, though. So in that sense, it's doing its job, right? It is, but is that because of the EU? I think that the rise of the right that we have seen is because of the EU and because the EU decides not to be an open institution. I love the European project. I think that it's a great project to be part of, but they really need to get a new PR person in. <laughs> I don't. I think the trouble with it, and you, you still sort of see it when um, people talk about it. Look at us giving advice to the second largest democratic body in the world yeah that's fine you know I can, I can probably <laughs> do that. but there's there is this attitude of oh we just need to you get these academics and journalists and politicians going on talk shows and just saying oh we just need to play around with it a little bit more and then finally people will feel that it represents them but it, it seems to me that that's the whole problem with it is that it's very much a, a bureaucrat's plaything rather than there's no sense that it is actually a tool of democratic will, it seems to me. Because the thing is, it does do fantastic things. It does do good things, but it also, I mean, like every government, it does bad things as well. No, of yeah. course, but we just need to be aware of that. There needs to be a European section in all of the newspapers. 
I suppose most newspapers have an international section, and that will lead with European news. But see, that's but it's reported as foreign news. It's what? stuff that happens in Strasbourg and Brussels. It's stuff that directly affects us, and it is stuff that people here are going to have an opinion on. Hmm. And so we just need to. I I hope. I bloody well hope that all we need to do is start bringing those stories to people so that they can make their own decisions about them. But I have doubts that most, so most British people want, you know, want to think of themselves as the same nation as French people. And when we've discussed Europe before, I've said that there's been a failure to build up any sense of narrative of Europeanness. There's there's people on the True. left who are very attracted to this idea and they'll they'll openly say, oh, I consider myself a European. But the thing it's... is, I don't think it's necessarily a left and right thing anymore. Europe now is just hate Europe, love Europe. And that is only going to make things worse because that means less, more polarisation and less actual democracy. Isn't, well, isn't part of the point of democracy that you're allowed to have polarisation? But it also means that there is going to be less of a chance of an actual debate on the finer points of legislation that's going to go through European Parliament, I think. Because at the moment, because we do, there has been a lot of talk of there being at least a pseudo alliance between the EPP and the socialists in the European Parliament. And then they would have an overall majority. So that that would be the centre right and the centre left, yes. respectively. Okay. Um, and then they would have a majority and then they can pass whatever the fuck they want. And that's not traditionally how Europe has worked. I mean, that that is how British Parliament works, though. It has, and I hate British Parliament for that reason. <laughs> I suppose, but, you know, coalitions tend to be dysfunctional at the best of times, and even parties are, by their, are you know, coalitions in one sense or another. So I wouldn't be too worried about, you know, this hammer blow of... Uh, of a coalition just pushing through legislation because there will inevitably dis be disagreements. Um, but it, it does sound like the sort of consensual politics you were kind of gesturing at, you know, about, about a minute ago when you're saying there's too much polarisation. Um, uh, the polarisation is the fact that there is one issue that is defining European part parties at the moment, and that is whether or not you are pro-Europe or pro-Euro. And that means that people who are not necessarily on the same page in terms of policy or ideology are going to be forced to make compromises in their ideology as they form coalitions within the parliament, I think. So I'm sorry, you think there's a problem with compromises? I think that in this particular case, it means that people are going to, that MEPs are going to be making compromises because there is such polarised people, especially in the Eurosceptic camp, I worry that we would have to start making compromises on particular points of like civil liberties um, and social issues that I personally would rather see as a more mainstream area. It's interesting. I think we'll, we're probably going to have to wrap it up here. Because oh, we have... can we do... We've oh. got like... One and a half minutes left. Do you think that Clegg's going to be kicked out? No, I don't really see it happening. No, um... neither do I. Okay, that discussion's done. Thank you <laughs> very much <laughs> for listening to uh, The Right Dishonourable. Um, uh, hopefully you uh, just stuck your headphones in and listened to us ramble on. Um, let us know if you thought it was fun. Did you have fun, Jimmy? I enjoyed myself immensely. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much to everybody for uh, liking, commenting, subscribing. Um, That's very presumptive, Jazza. You don't, you don't know whether or not they're going to do it. You're not helping, Jimmy. <laughs> if you've made it this far, you may as if, well. Yeah, actually, you... to be fair, if you've made it this far, we'll send you money in the post. Just leave your address downstairs. Yeah, leave your address, name, uh, credit card details. Yeah, uh, mother's just... maiden name. Yeah, uh... just all the good stuff. Precisely, and then we'll send you uh, the equivalent of fifty million pounds um, uh, from a trust fund in Nigeria. Okay, but say bye, Jimmy. Bye. Bye. We used to drink I'm waiting for a second chance
time.